At the end of the night, Leona helped the battle with her buffs, telling the knights to seek help with the healing. Along with Arno who is resting, relieved that fortunately Aldian emptied the building, resulting there isn't much harm done after Lucius's battle where he needs to destroy the building. Other than that, all those larvae died at once, thanks to that, their brainwashing has been undone which mean that Aldian has died. A moment later, Lucius turns around, he smiles brightly as the party of two come back from their own battle, along with Claudia with her child in hand. The burden of all the battle disappeared in an instant as Aria and her kid falls into Lucius' arms, marking that the battle with Aldian's plot to take over the third parish temple is ended. The next few days that are extremely hectic, with treating the injured, arresting the demon god worshippers that Aldian brought from the central parish, and a mountain of other work to take care of, then of course, among the crucial things to take care of, encouraging the troops fatigued throughout those hectic days, as well as purging the demon god worshippers who had been in hiding for years were also part of it. Alponso also finally recovered saying how he cannot believe that a priest of his level could be deprived of his own will and completely controlled by Aldian. Zephyr and Ned also present where Alponso thanks them for saving him along with the third parish temple. Zephyr says that he only did what any human should have, where he then present a gift to the bishop intending to congratulate him to recover. It is Aldian's head, caged in a memora's birdcage, which he got from Eurydica's tomb that makes it impossible for anyone trapped inside to use any skill, and that birdcage also preserves the state that they were in when put inside. That shocks the bishop, saying that they should burn him down, yet Zephyr assures him that the queen worm is already dead, so Aldian can no longer use his ability, and now he is completely harmless. Even though Aldian is a demon god cult executive, that make it possible to them to extract useful information from him. Ned then also expresses how he is feeling very refreshed right now, besides that he has discovered that information, that matter has become something that he can't handle alone. Zephyr then give Alponso the information he gathered regarding the demon god cult. Upon reading it, Alponso is so shocked with the information he reads about the demon god advent plan, destruction and reconstruction of the world, and the ones who are pushing that plan is the Eastern Union. It is then explained that in the kingdom of Kayan that occupies half of the Aslan continent, there are two powers, the Western Alliance of the Western Lords, and the Eastern Union of the Eastern Lords. The two power originally held nearly the same amount of strength, but after the Giornetti Duke House of the Western Alliance produced both the Queen and the Saint of Light, the balance of power collapsed. Zephyr explained further that the Eastern Union, after several difficulties, had been experiencing a continuous slump since the dungeon bubble break. They would even sold some of their territories to the West. Then the difference in strength had become too large, that is why, a few years ago, among the nobles of the Eastern Union, the demon god cult permeated their ranks like ink in the water. As a result, two of the eight challenges of the world, Blue Dragon Artalis and Ice Dragon Morenia started to destroy the western territories. Then, Zephyr offer himself and Ned to go to slay the dragons. That surprise Alponso, with how outrageous that is, even with the two of them while Lucius is feeling left out, wanting to go as well. But Zephyr tells him that Lucius has to protect the third parish, and if something bad happens to Lucius's family, the scale of the battle may be flipped completely on their heads. And right at that moment, Lucius swear on his name as the saint, to name Zephyr and Ned as senior temple knights as thanks for the work they have done protecting the parish, they will be also granted either gold, jewels, and magic stone. Being senior knight will allow them to enter all territories that the Temple of Light's religious influence reaches. They can use any kind of commodities they want in the Temple of Light in the name of the saint, and Lucius even write them a certificate that allows them to mobilize troops. And Lucius and his uncle will pay their offerings that they have to pay to the temple, half from each of them. Stupefied Alponso, right after they shake hand on it and bid their farewell. But as they do so, suddenly the birdcage that keeps Aldian's head shines extruding crimson magic surprising the party. With little life force Aldian has, someone tracks him down and possesses him. The being talks, saying that he thought he would connect with Aldian since he felt his life force disappearing. With his red devilish eyes, he asks the party whether they are the ones who killed Aldian, and instead of answering, Lucius asks who that being is. He then extrudes his overwhelming aura, filling the room with it, then telling Lucius to kneel before he asks. Right after, he claimed to be the demon god cult leader. That surprised the party, while Lucius thought that the leader must have come to finish them off after finding out Aldian failed, while swearing to himself that his overpriced equipment is being repaired. 
The demon god cult then continues, looking at Zephyr saying that he feels that unnerving energy he extrudes. Then he knows that Zephyr must be the owner of the dragon heart. Suddenly, Lucius and Ned step forward to deal with the demon god cult leader, while Ned also telling Zephyr to get away first, and they both will try to buy him some time. While Lucius wondering to himself that he still have his trump card, glimpse of glory, even though it won't be easy, he is determined not to allow him to take the dragon heart. That surprise Zephyr moved with their determination to fight for him, while both of Ned and Lucius preparing their teamwork. In an instant, they dash forward, instantly appear right at the median of the magic, intending to destroy Aldian's head to break the connection of the magic. But the demon god cult leader already cast his magic to block both of their attack, simultaneously cast another magic to root both of them, making them unable to do anything beyond trying. That caught them off guard, with Ned shocks that the magic was activated before he even had the chance to dodge using Crow Cape, while Lucius's mana keep dispersing making him unable to use any skill. The demon god cult leader uses a skill from the ancient dragon's shadow, while telling them to not do anything stupid, because that skill is not something the likes of them can undo. He also inwardly thinking that someone should have come to interfere and change the situation. But that seems to have been a wasted trip for him, for finding out that it total failure on Aldian. Having enough of it, he uses all kind of magic and curse to deal with Ned and the Saint, intending to finish them off. While Alponso can only pray to the area, the Goddess of Light, where he is unable to do anything himself to change the situation with the appearance of the demon god cult leader. Suddenly Zephyr joined the fray using light magic to cut off the root that bind his two comrades. That surprised the demon god cult leader with the sight of Zephyr wielding the sword of light, along with the power of the dragon heart he possesses. Or before that the demon god cult leader was thinking that it was a waste of time to come there, but to find an amusing guy right in front of him. He is wondering who someone that is not a saint can be a chosen one. Zephyr smiles that he wants to know, so Zephyr claims that he can tell that much for the demon god cult leader. But before that, he offers him a wager, saying that it would be boring to just tell him. So then, the loser tells the winner on thing they want to know. Then, if Zephyr wins, he is going to tell his comrades the demon god cult leader's identity. And if he wins, he can do the same to his comrades too. That surprised the demon god cult leader, as well as both Ned and Lucius, because not even Alden knew the real identity of the demon god cult leader. But to think that Zephyr knows that much is beyond his thinking. Though, the demon god cult leader can tell whether someone is lying or not with his detection skill, and he determines that Zephyr really knows his identity. But still, he agrees to it, so Zephyr throws up the coin. The air grew tense as the coin falls down, and the demon god cult leader chooses tails while Zephyr chooses head. As the coin falls down on Zephyr's hand, both of Ned and Lucius knows that it's tail, and Ned is unable to understand that Zephyr is leaving it up to chance or whether he prepares some sort of trick. But then, a jolt of magic attack on hands that cover the coin. A light blows up from it, and the source of that is the collision of Zephyr, and the cult leader's mana condensed to an extreme level of density. What decides the result of a coin toss is when the hand that covers the coin is completely opened, the one who flips it and solidifies their victory when the hand opens. Zephyr tries to cover his hands, defending against the attack that comes from the cult leader's magic power. It's a battle that the winner will be decided by crushing the opponent's interference, a contest of strength with such a simple rule. That is the true nature of that wager, where both the cult leader constantly fighting with Zephyr to open the hand while he is trying to decide the outcome. In a clash with no criteria for victory or defeat, it's difficult to withdraw. Even if one didn't intend to see it through to the end, that's why they made the rule. As the timing is closing in on Zephyr, he throws the coin away from him. Both of them nose and still chase the coin with their magic. But then, Zephyr uses the Dragon King style move that surprised the cult leader as he notices that it's the Eastern One's electrical acceleration technique. With that technique, Zephyr punched the coin into the ground, breaking the floor into the basement of the temple. At that exact moment, the dragonification duration is over, and that decides their wager. The coin is split in half, one that land on tail, and the other half on head, marking their wager as a draw. A moment later after that wager, Ned tells the story to Claudia that makes her expresses how amazing Zephyr is, with how Zephyr accurately grasped the cult leader's mentality that resulting not much harm to the party. It turns out that because it's a draw, both Zephyr and the cult leader agree on using the Oath Ring, a token of the promise between two people. If one breaks the promise, the ring of the other breaks, and a sentence for the breaker begins. The sentence is one of their sense disappears for one month. 
and after looking for a way to break the oath ring in the temple, both Zephyr and Lucius fails to find a way. So, until their second round, Zephyr can't reveal the cult leader's identity to the party, but he smiles wickedly, saying that not directly anyway. With his evil smile he intending to give them a riddle to solve, or a hint that doesn't count breaking the oath. Before that, he reveals that it's even more dangerous than even the Eastern Union, so he can't tell anyone about that but the people who he truly trusts. The demon god cult leader is Polaris Albert Kayan, the first prince of the Kayan kingdom, and the youngest cardinal of the Temple of Light, as he is not expecting that he thought Zephyr would spill about him to his party already. And with that the cult leader is suspecting that Zephyr might have an enormous amount of ambition, that he looks forward to it. Anyway, he is at the party of Altair Justina Cayenne, his sister, where she is celebrating her 20th birthday, and Altair Zephyr's lover in his past life. At night that day, Lucius is losing sleep because the demon god cult leader, as if he connects all the keywords Zephyr told him. He knows that the cult leader is one so powerful that they can't handle, but his family and him can no longer withdraw from the battle, while Ned is determined that there's no choice but to fight and win because his revenge isn't over yet. Both his master and his cult brother along with the facilitators that Aldean spoke of. He can't stop until he has uprooted them all. And if it wasn't for Zephyr, then forget about revenge. Right about now Ned would be regretting his foolishness after being thrown away by the demon god cult. He owes Zephyr a debt greater than his life, and he will repay him, no matter how powerful of an opponent he must fight. Meanwhile, Zephyr's mind also occupied while he is meditating. He is thinking about why the cult leader showed up. But then, the silver key in his left hand glows up, marking that Mercedes is calling up to him. He then enter the space that connected with the silver key. Inside Mercedes welcomes him, with her pet in hand. There Zephyr figures out that the one giving perks of the silver key is Mercedes, so he asks her about it. So she explained that she is his manager after all, with it comes her own privileges. She also says that she would be disgraced if Zephyr died a boring death after sending him off empty-handed, when the gods desire entertainment. After that, with her authority, she teleport them both to sit down. Then Mercedes delivers the main point of the message. There the gods want to tell Zephyr the addition of rules and rewards. Even though it was rather fun, his insolence of threatening the gods with his life will not be forgiven a second time. Additionally, if he ever do something like that again, the perks he was given will be collected immediately. Zephyr will then be designated as prey, and every single person who hunts him will be given the perks he has collected from him. Right after, Mercedes explained the rewards and new rules that he has to carry, about how that is nothing free in the world. Trading the request from the gods and Zephyr will be rewarded. On the next day, both Zephyr and Ned bid their farewell to the priest and priestess from the temple, going to proceed into his next plan. Then they depart as Lucius thoughts about his role. It's not only the demon god cult, nobles, the rich, adventurers, there are countless people aiming for the dragon heart. His role is to draw their attention to him pretending that he secured it, and make it easier for Zephyr to act. With that, he commands the knight to lock the gates, prohibit anyone into the temple and declare that from that point on, the great third parish temple will be blockaded indefinitely. Meanwhile in the tomb, Eurydica is able to feel Zephyr's presence is getting further away, marking that he is leaving that place. And it is her time to go as well, to where she and her lover were meant to go. With that, her role is over, along with her thousand years of loneliness. She leave it all to the one who inherited their mission, and her descendant who will walk alongside him. Where she get a letter from Lucius, her older cousin, congratulates her on her birthday, adding that he is apologizing that he couldn't come to the party because of the raid. With the letter, he also said that he will send her a birthday gift instead, and he is sure that she will like it. At that exact moment, a commotion arrive at her residence. It was Zephyr beating the people that queue in the yard for a chance to meet her. That is when she knows that Lucius' gift to her is something she has always desired, someone who will be her strength. A few moments before that, when Zephyr and Ned arrive at her territory, it is explained that the territory that was awarded to Altair, along with the title of Grand Duchess of Lindell, when she was 16, Zephyr arrives showing the letter from Lucius, the Saint of Light to the Knight so they let them in. Inside, there is an envoy that will escort them, as Ned is skeptical that coming to the princess will be any help to them in the dragon raid. As they are talking about it, there's someone thrown away from the castle into their face. The escort then explain that they are suitors who come to see the princess, that surprise Ned with how they are a lot of them that look like thugs instead. It is then revealed that Princess Altair Justine Kayen. She has looks, talent, noble bloodline, a woman that born with everything and the shining start of a slam, a lucky child who was promised the throne without the need to push her older brothers aside. A lot of nobles are coveting her hand in marriage, because if one that did will be the next king. 
but with a single word, where she said that she doesn't even to utter a single word about marriage to weak men. From just that words, countless men of nobility, to gain the qualification to even have a conversation with her, continued to take up the challenge. The challenge to fight Altair's first guardian knight called Ophelia Amalith, only to get repeatedly getting their asses beaten miserably and going back to their homes. Upon checking the contenders, they are not even close to Zephyr or Ned, but they are also people who wouldn't be disrespected anywhere they go. It's just that Ophelia is one of the continent's strongest ten. That makes Zephyr smiles to see her in her younger form, while at the same time, there's a huge guy calling out to Zephyr and Ned asking who they are. He is mad because the end of the line is on the opposite end, and he is already standing there for three days straight. So Zephyr reveals that he is an envoy of the saint, and asking the man to move so he can proceed to meet the princess. In the end, the man step aside then letting Zephyr and Ned pass by them. Zephyr thoughts how annoying that group of people are, why they are talking behind his back about the dragon raid and how they are gossiping about the possibility of the princess that might also investing in the raid. The huge man goes as far as spouting rumors about Altair, and Lucius is a lover. He smiles wickedly as he claims that everyone in the capital has heard that rumor. Lucius being in a filthy relationship with his own cousin, he even adds that he heard they conceived a child who's being raised secretly in the temple. In an instant, a punch was thrown to him, blasting him away. It was Zephyr who only moves a single hand to beat him to a pulp. The other man are calling to him as he flew away. A moment later, Zephyr calls out to them to come as well, as he says that they are perverts who stood in line for three days straight just to get their asses beaten. So he says that they don't need to wait in line anymore then asks them to come to him. And that's how Altair sees him beating them up from her window. Later that day, the escort bring both Zephyr and Ned inside to the castle, as he is apologizing that he should have escorted them better so they don't pick a fight. There, suddenly a gentle voice sounded behind them, asking whether they like her greenhouse. In the original future, Altair and Zephyr don't meet for another few years. He trains in the cave with Ned for a year, and only after Zephyr comes out of the cave does the flow of time resumes for him. He greets the princess, kissing her hand and feels so relieved that to think this moment arrived so soon. With the information Lucius gives her with the letter, she asks Zephyr about what he can do for her in detail. While Ned is wondering on why her first night, Ophelia keeps glaring at him. It was Zephyr, the one who made the fuss, not Ned, that is why he wonders whether they have met somewhere before. Meanwhile, Zephyr knows that Altair's communion skill still hasn't fully bloomed at this point in time. She can't read someone's memories at will like Eurydica. But, since she has the talent for it, she was able to screen people with a special sense. And with that talent, she gathered comrades to oppose the demon god cult. Furthermore, she is originally Zephyr's senior who walked this path before him. But, at first, he wanted a vague idea of success, and then revenge as per his master Ned's dying wish. Then she showed him something much greater. What she wants are strong comrades who she can trust. That's when Zephyr display his 1% dragon heart, as he declares that he can fulfill that desire of hers, and how he thinks that it's probably faster if he shows her instead of telling her. That catches both of their attention, the power of a person who received the dragon heart transplant. Alter then asks Ophelia whether she already had a fight with Zephyr, which she says that she didn't yet. Like knowing what she wants, Ophelia steps forwards while unsheathing her sword, saying that she will try having around three bouts with him. The air grows tense as they face each other, Zephyr the human who possesses the dragon heart and Ophelia, one of the ten strongest knight in the kingdom. Looking at him, she knows that he looks like he is just standing still, yet he has no openings. She will be the one to be devoured if she just rush in recklessly. She then carefully moves forward, and on the first bout, he parried her sword with hand movements like a flowing stream. On the second bout, her strongest thrusts couldn't even penetrate his skin. On the third bout, her weapon left her hand before she knew it, and a heavy palm strike slammed into her stomach, blasting her away. And in an instant, Zephyr appears behind her with his hand that able to manifest the dragon's claw pointed at her neck, as he asks her whether they should continue the fight. Zephyr then talks to Altair, saying that he heard she was trying to form a dragon expedition there he claims that in a month time, he will offer her the blue dragon's head. Altair asks what he wants in return for it, which he tells her to think of an appropriate reward herself. Along with it, he requests as many healers as she can lend after the trouble with the Tomb of the Abominable Princess raid. Right after, she asks about the chance of him slaying the Blue Dragon, which she tells her that depends on her, while also giving her the Crystal of Magic that contained the ancient magic of the Media Kingdom that Eurydica mastered. He then explained that it was entrusted to him by her ancestor, and Eurydica told him to deliver that to her, no matter what. 
along with it. Altair will immediately become the strongest ally once she absorbs the Crystal of Magic, and she will also be able to smoothly tune his dragon heart. After that, Zephyr excuses himself, and their first meeting was miles better from the one in his past life, and for him, that is good enough for now. Even though he was dying to see her, that is their first time meeting in this life through Lucius's introduction. Showing off his value and piquing her interest in him is good enough. In the end, she is bound to come to find him, so he will wait for her. After they left, Ophelia expresses that Zephyr is incredible, though she is a bit worried that Lucius introduced him, since he has a terrible eye for people. Yet, in terms of skill, Zephyr is close to the talent that Altair wants. However, Ophelia suspects that Zephyr seems a bit weak for a holder of a dragon heart. So Altair explains that the dragon heart has not yet fully settled into his body, and she knows he will become even stronger. Right after, she wonders how he talked as if he met Eurydica herself, since she was a legendary archmage. It's not a stretch to say that she could have been alive within the tomb. And if that's true, then the one who transplanted the dragon heart into him was Princess Eurydica herself. That makes her thinks how he wields such incredible chance for a nameless knight, and she immediately knows that he may become the key to her plans. She also has something bothering her mind. It wasn't one of the warm or ominous feeling that she always feel when she come into contact with someone. That is the second time in her life that she saw something, a glimpse of their other future shown to her which bother her mind. Somewhere else at the demon god cult's castle, the vice cult leader answered the summons of the cult leader upon him. That's when the cult leader reveals that Aldean has been killed, and there is now a vacant spot amongst the twelve apostles. The cult leader then commands him to make sure that the apocalypse plan that he entrusted to them all must be proceeded diligently, and that Aldean's vacancy does not create any setbacks in the plan. After commanding his subject, the cult leader disappears and the vice leader immediately orders his men to prepare the phantom horse, so he can head to the third parish right away. Back at the kingdom's castle, Altair goes to her dungeon, after trying so hard so far as investments, deciphering ancient scriptures in the dungeon to help in raiding Princess Eurydica's tomb. She got the crystal of magic back, the grimoire that she desperately needed to develop her magic that had been stagnant at level 2. That reminds her about that time her master is apologizing to her, how she unable to teach Altair further and only able to get her that far. And now she finally has a way to, and probably the power to probably beat that man. Her only enemy in sight, the demon god cult leader. As he uses the crystal, her mind moves into a subspace that immediately connected into her mind. There she can feel the enormous amount of magic knowledge that arranged like stars. Also a soft warm voice speaks to her, saying that it is beautiful and that is the magic of Menia that they pursue. It is Eurydica speaks to Altair, adding that though she is nothing more than a remnant within the crystal of magic, she wanted to meet Altair, her descendant, and her heir, along with her magic. Somewhere else, Zephyr and Ned playing rock, paper, scissors. Deciding that Zephyr will go to the party and Ned stealthily will search for any demon god cult member within the castle. So then Zephyr preparing to go, as Ned offers him the mist bracelet. But Zephyr tells him to wear it since one of the ten strongest knight present in the castle. Zephyr also explained that Ophelia was paying pretty close attention to Ned. Then there is a possibility that she might be the dangerous person, aside that he doesn't know her. Zephyr then reveals that she is probably not a demon god worshipper, but still, he tells Ned to be careful, with the thoughts that Ned will take care of himself as long as Zephyr tell him that much. Right after, Zephyr prepared himself as well, using dust from the fire pit. He changed his silver hair into a little darker, as well as using an eastern technique of changing his appearance by adjusting his facial muscle and expression. The specialty of the real shadow disciple, who will rise to be one of the twelve apostle in the future. In the party, people talks about the result of Lucius's raid, and Zephyr talks to one of the huge merchant in the kingdom. There the merchant reveals how Zephyr is quite talented, after he takes a closer look. He is able to figure out that Zephyr is the one that beat up the priests of the Temple of the Sky at the yard of the castle. That immediately surprises Zephyr, because such a weak-looking person saw through his transfiguration, wondering who that guy is. Somewhere else in the castle, Ned is cleaning up the demon god cult's member, going through the east wing. As he jumps around, he thoughts how massive the castle are. He is unable to believe that one person owns that, and how he doesn't think he would ever get used to it. He also thinking that Lucius's newlywed home in the temple was similar in size to his old house, so it was comfortable there for Ned. Not only the size, but also that warm ambience, Ned's home was also like that. 
He then remembers the last time he ever saw his mother along with his older sister. As he is thinking about all of it, a crude and glaring voice calling out to him, asking what he is doing on the roof, instead of enjoying the party. It is Ophelia, expressing how Ned is weird, taking a nighttime stroll in quite a peculiar place. That makes him think that it's his blunder for couldn't have sensed her presence, even after wearing the mist bracelets as a pair, and he should only barely be detectable, even with a legendary rank detection skill. Ophelia then tells him not to be nervous, she only came there because she vaguely felt something out of place. As a matter of fact, she had business with him, so she asks for some time with him. Ned then calls out to her as liar, so he asks her for how long she has tailing him, where she reveals that it was worth a shot, and she has been tailing him from the second floor of the East Wing. Being in the corner, Ned tells her that the people he killed were Demon God Cult's member, and he adds that she should be able to confirm that, since there are corpse of branded worms around them. He then apologizes for rummaging about without permission, explaining that their leader judged that a quick purge as soon as possible should be prioritized over an agreement. Ophelia then expresses how excellent and a fine judgment it is, but then she says that he is misunderstanding on why she came to see Ned. That instant, she strikes him with her energy's sword, explaining that the dragon raid the princess's long-cherished wish. She worked very hard to gather exception talents to make it a success. Ned's comrade, Zephyr, already proved himself, however, she tells Ned that he have yet to be verified. Then she summons her aura into her blade, as she tells him to prove his strength to her. Ned then expresses his own mind as well, saying that she is insisting on being punished, so then he will welcome her strikes. Somewhere else that night, the cult vice leader, using pack of hounds-like creature, found the traces of Aldean's demonification. Along with it, he found traces of scorch marks from lightning. He now knows that those are no doubt the traces of a Dragon King-style martial artist. Not only that, he inspect the carriage that's supposed to take Aldean away. There he found a deadly poison belonging to Persephone that shouldn't exist in a place like that. And now he assumes that the Eastern One, the Saint, and the Tarantula who recently entered the cult must have joined forces. They killed Aldean as planned. That makes him unable to believe they would commit such insanity during a mission with the cult's future on the line. And now, he wonders who has the dragon heart, whether it's Lucius or the Eastern One, a few selected human who can receive implant of the dragon heart. Suddenly a mysterious woman appears, with her red crimson eyes she looks at the vice cult leader, and she knows, one that wears a bird beak mask could only be the vice cult leader. That instant, she jumps away from the vice cult leader, and the vice cult leader has a hunch that person is related to that situation, and she mustn't lost her. Using the hound creature she summons, she commands them to follow suit the mysterious woman. A while later, the hounds manages to chase her and bite her shoulder that makes the vice cult leader happy that she manages to caught her. Only to find that mysterious woman uses the eastern technique, Dragon King style, the thunderclap palm. That just the person that the vice cult leader wants to see. So she takes out a whip going to fight against that mysterious person that belonged to the eastern continent. At the same time, another fight keeps going on on top of the roof of Altair's castle. It was Ned against one of the ten strongest knight of the continent. Dashes of light resulted from their clashes, and their swords strike. That makes Ned mad, as it makes him sense that she has some discrimination in that assessment because they have had way more than three bouts. As their swords meet again, he asks whether she was saying someone who's not on par with her can't participate in the dragon raid. Ophelia stays silent, but then Ned's mirage sword changes its form into some kind of snake then he manages to disarm her. But she doesn't give up yet, instead she throws a kick towards Ned, in fact, she barrages him with her kicks, blowing dust everywhere, and that makes her lose sight of him. But in that instant, Ned appears behind her, exactly like what Zephyr did, saying what a great technique that is. Somewhere else, at the lake near the area where Aldean got killed, the mysterious woman is walking towards it. She feels relieved that she can finally lost her, the vice cult leader, where her master was always wary of her. It turns out that she supposes to come into the raid to take the dragon heart, but then, she got holed up with the princess's subordinates, Ophelia. She takes off the hood on her head, revealing the red hair that she has, thinking that she finds evidence of betrayal by her master's disciple, who was put into this operation, and even that bitch vice cult leader is loitering around the operation area. At the same time, Ophelia reveals to Ned that fact, the shadow disciple of the Eastern One, one of the Twelve Apostles, called Smiling Woman, a master of transfiguration. Ophelia was preventing her from joining the operation of seizing the dragon heart. Ophelia notices Ned's breathing, step technique, 
anticipation of the next moves, down to the finest details. Ned and that woman have similarities unique to ones who have learned the same martial art. Ophelia is even more certain of it after fighting him. She also reveals that Zephyr showed the same similarities, but the princess has already confirmed that he can be trusted. Then, most of all, the shadow disciple, smiling woman, shares a resemblance to Ned, as if they are related by blood. So then Ophelia asks whether Ned is truly an ally. That shocks and ended up confuses him, because all he knows Zephyr is the shadow disciple. Back before leaving the third parish, Ned is torturing Aldian for information. There Aldian apologizes to Ned for killing his father with the excuse of him being only a priest and have to do what the temple asks him to. Then he also tells Ned to not trust Zephyr, telling that Zephyr is deceiving Ned. Walking on the yard, Ned thoughts that Aldian's words are the rambling of a madman, not even worth listening to. That's why he has been ignoring them until now. But after Ophelia reveals what she knows about the red-haired woman, who might be his sister, which he thought for the longest time might be dead is still alive. He comes into a crossroad, who is the one of the Dragon King School's shadow disciple. And now he wants the truth. Meanwhile at the party, Zephyr is dealing with big figure, Philip that helped Altair in her affair as a mentor. That's slowly building strength in the darkness then giving his full support to Altair. And as far as Zephyr knows, Philip was killed by the smiling woman. Then now Zephyr has two priority. One is not letting Philip die then stopping the smiling woman without knowing where she will appear from. The only problem is that she can change into any form she desires, whether it be a man or a woman. And she never showed her true appearance, even to Zephyr, so he might as well have no idea what she looks like. In any case, Ned should have come back by now. Then as he turns around into the room, Ned is already waiting for him with dagger in hand. That instant, Zephyr steps back, that even surprise himself with it, only to remember that he instinctively do it because when he was in the cave with him, he always beat Zephyr senseless whenever he was in that kind of mood. But then, Zephyr asks Ned whether did something happen. So Ned explained that he was caught by Ophelia as he was searching around the mansion, also revealing the facts that she said she met someone that seemed to be his older sister. As Zephyr sits down, Ned says that the shadow disciple of the Dragon King school that Ophelia blocking is his sister. That's when Zephyr remembers the woman he met at his past live far into the future. There she asks who taught him the technique he has, implicating that she is looking for Ned, her younger brother. And now he knows that he boned his master's sister. He fails himself, for never thoughts of it, when once the Eastern One reveals that a martial body is a very rare, and that it's hereditary. A sibling of one with martial body is also highly likely to have it. Then that means the Eastern One plotted with Aldian to destroy Ned's family to obtain them from the start. And after all that, he abandoned Ned once he become useless, the Eastern One, a fucking bastard. Ned then says that he doesn't know, yet, he doesn't think Ophelia has any reason to lie to him. As he calls out to Zephyr, it doesn't make any sense that everything Zephyr has said to Ned is lies either. Ned's father trusted Aldian, Ned trusted his master, both their lives fell, or almost fell into the depths of hell because they trusted the wrong people. That is why Ned was afraid of putting his trust in someone once again. But even so, after all of that time both of Ned and Zephyr went through, all of the time when they have already faced and overcome several life or death moments together. They are brothers. He wants to believe that their camaraderie was real and in Zephyr. He just needs something, even the smallest thing, as Ned let down his dagger and begs Zephyr to give him proof that he can trust Zephyr. That's when Zephyr starting to reveal it. Originally, they were supposed to meet around three months later. After stealing the dragon heart, Ned, who found out the truth from the Silver Knight, ran away. And the demon god cult, the entire world was chasing Ned down. He received a several injury from his senior brother, the Eastern One's son, in one of the eight challenges of the world, Canyon of Oblivion and were left to die. He also stole the dragon heart from Ned at that time. Zephyr was one of the temple slaves who was tracking him, and he happened to meet Ned after he fall into a cave under a cliff and learned the Dragon King-style martial arts from Ned, because it was impossible for injured man and a weakling to escape the Canyon of Oblivion. Zephyr, who became stronger thanks to that power being the foundation, finally reached the pinnacle of humanity. But, ultimately he couldn't stop the world from being destroyed, and couldn't protect a single person to the end. Zephyr is the last human, a hero, a loser, and a regressor who returned to the past with memories of ten years into the future, and Ned's only disciple. Back then, Ned had a plan. How much stronger he, his disciple, needed to get to escape the Canyon of Oblivion, the condition of his body and taking all that into account, how long he could take to train Zephyr in that cave. Survival, and his desire for revenge toward his master, who betrayed him. These purpose alone were the only things prolonging his life. 
However, they had no choice but to come out of the cave earlier than planned. Zephyr has always regretted it. If he had become stronger a little faster, if he had learned a little more, the result could have been different, they could have escaped together. Instead of Ned sacrificing himself for someone like Zephyr while giving up on the revenge that he so desired. Ned is looking behind towards Zephyr, calling him out to take a good look. Taking a stance right in front of the monster, Ned uses the final secret art that he couldn't pass down to Zephyr. On that day, Zephyr saw his master's back, and he couldn't never forget it. Zephyr tells that story to Ned into the rising sun, and Ned is having a hard time to believe it. But still, it makes too much sense for Ned not to believe. From using a divine artifact when he is not even a priest, knowing way too much information, and it's plausible if he returned to the past with the perks from the gods. Zephyr then apologizes for approaching Ned with lies. He wasn't sure he would be able to make Ned believe that in such a short period of time, and he thought it would be better to just make Ned doubt the demon god cult. Zephyr expresses that to fight the demon god again, he needs him, and more importantly, he wants Ned to live. Now, the reason why Ned kept moving wasn't just revenge. He thought it was natural to live as a part of his family, for someone like him, who had his family's peerage, the old duty of watching over the blood tears, his family, and everything else stolen from him and become a shell of a man. His master granted him a new purpose to live as his disciple. Because of him, Ned worked himself to death to become stronger to repay the kindness of his master, who took him in. Because of him, he happily took on all sorts of filthy errands, because he believed there was a just reason for anything that his master did. A master-disciple relationship is one that is akin to family, even if there are no blood relations. Thrusting your family and helping each other is natural. Ned was reproaching himself for living his life wrong, but then his life had meaning in its own right since he left something behind in this world. Ned stands up going to go out as he taps Zephyr's shoulder, thinking that taking revenge for him in the past life and helping him in this life, a hero who returned to the past to save the world, Ned knows that he had taken in quite the absurd disciple. He expresses how he expect nothing less from his disciple. Ned goes out, as he is saying that he won't let Zephyr shoulder it all on his own, and offers to walk together in this life. They both see Philip's group that morning, and as expected of Altair's comrades, things progress quickly. But Altair is absent, and Zephyr knows that she not suddenly appearing at a time like that would mean that she is asleep because of the grimoire. A crystal form grimoire, different from a book form, makes a copy of its contents directly into the user's brain. Its only flaw is the side effect, one fall asleep during the time that the magic incantations fuse with the brain. The longer the duration of the sleep, the greater the grimoire's quality, and symptoms such as fever also accompany it. Altair is probably receiving care from a healer, but since it's not an injury, they won't be of much help. It ultimately depends on how quickly Altair can absorb all the magic. After that, days went by in a flash, they had to prepare many things for the Blue Dragon Raid, research new fighting methods to match their new items, and with the party members. One of the priestess asks Zephyr to come into her arms, and Zephyr tells her to just make it quick. She uses a skill called Angel's Embrace, sending Jolt of Magic into Zephyr's body to check the health and physical characteristics in great details. That makes Zephyr shouts out all kinds of curse words, as the priestess tells him to endure it for a little longer. That makes Ned reluctant to go through with it. Still he can't get away from it, and as he falls down flat on the ground, Ophelia comes into the room, commenting on how Ned looks so pathetic. There she informed both Zephyr and Ned that the princess is calling for both of them, surprising Zephyr that Altair finally woke up while Ned is confused with where to look for being right below Ophelia. A moment later, from her bed, Altair greets both of Zephyr and Ned, while all Zephyr can thoughts of is that might be someone had told Altair about him. Back when her mind is directly connected into the crystal, Eurydica congratulates her that the proof of her meridian has reached level 3. The basis knowledge of Median magic is within Altair now. All she have left is to reach enlightenment through training and raise its level. A new star will be added to the line every time she level it up. Eurydica adds that she is sure Altair will be able to accomplish what no human, even she couldn't do, to reach level 8 of Median magic. When she does, the connection between Altair and Eurydica reaches its end, and she wakes up. She is welcomed by a priestess and Ophelia, where she has a headache and the priestess informs her that she has been asleep for a week, so she must not move so suddenly. The only thing she can remember is on the ends of the crystal magic, is that Eurydica tells her to thrust Zephyr, so Altair asks Ophelia to call Zephyr right away. Back to now, Altair claims to have wanted to call Zephyr earlier, but she hasn't been feeling well lately, so she apologizes for it, and to poorly greets them in her sleepwear. Zephyr knows that Eurydica might tells her something, 
that isn't just a matter of their relationship. Right after, Zephyr gives out his hand to Altair, implicating to her to read his memories, and asking whether she has learned the communion skill. So she says that when Zephyr gave her the crystal of magic, she thought he was trying to show her his ability and enter her party. Rather than that, she assumes that he was trying to raise her to use her for his plan. Unfortunately, she can't use it yet. The communion skill is an unexpectedly advanced skill, and as a level 3, she can't freely read others' memories like her ancestor, who was a level 7. She then asks to continue their conversation from a week ago, and wants him to try persuade her to come up with a surefire plan to slay the dragon. Zephyr takes up the challenge while also asking her whether she had already eaten when activates his silver key to take out bundles of letters, adding that the contents are a lot to listen to on an empty stomach. A few days later, they depart into the region where the blue dragon resides, and Zephyr is sure that Altair will do her best to leave traces befitting the princess of debauchery, as he notices how excited she is to be outside the castle. On the other hand, Zephyr also sure the demon god worshippers are in a frenzy doubting each other. The other people in power are bound to be focused on Lucius's seclusion. But that will only last around a month, no more than two. Until then, Zephyr must earn as much as possible and as quietly as possible with no distraction. The first step to that is the Blue Dragon Raid and forming an alliance with the Elf. Meanwhile, Ned remembers that he went to that region before. He knows the scenery of the endlessly stretching golden wheat field was amazing. The other members says that was in the past and open the window to reveals the state of the region now. It turns out that the region turned into ruins, left a plain full of remnant of the Blue Dragon's poison. After three years ago, it ended like that since the blue dragon flew over the region and made its nest at the water source of the river that flows through here and spews deadly poison. Healer were dispatched, but they failed to purify the land, and 80% of the farmland was eradicated in just three years. Yet, Zephyr knows, by the next year the remaining 20% will also become deadly land. And he honestly thoughts it's a miracle that it managed to last three years, then it's because the river water itself is special. A moment later, they go into the gate of the last human settlement, which Altair's party uses as the last post to go to the Blue Dragon Raid. Inside, Altair explained that it's the medical relief station. It's a place that protects farmers who lost their place to live to the poison disaster. A soldier the Lord of Danakil sent is supposed to meet with them there, where the front lines lack supplies. So Altair asks Zephyr to wait there while they will also performing maintenance as they wait. Zephyr has no problem with it, while at the same time, a cough can be heard from one of the house that's sheltering the farmer. Inside the house, Zephyr talks to the priest, offer him a water to drink as well as asking who the man is. There the priest informs Zephyr that he is Grimes. A night, he came there from the Lord's castle. But monsters appeared while he was on patrol, which he took care of but came back injured. Zephyr notices the violet skin. He knows that the blue dragon's poison has spread throughout his entire body. Those are symptoms that can be seen when drinking poisonous water or being attacked by monsters from the nest. Just like the land, there's nothing a healer can do to purify him. He can only receive treatment to reduce his suffering and wait until the day he dies. Altair then whispers to Zephyr, saying that she knows Grimes, explaining that he is trustworthy knight with great fighting prowess. She thinks he might be the soldier that the Lord sent. Zephyr then requesting to tighten the security on the station as he takes out stuff from his silver room. Thinking even though there's no one who can deal with the blue dragon's poison, it's not like he can't do anything about it. He takes out deadly poison needle, then from now on, he announces that place will be a class 1 restricted area. While Zephyr treating the injured knight, Altair senses that someone is coming into the station, and outside is Captain Regulus Danakil, along with his army, the Scarecrow Knights. He got welcomed by Philip, as he expresses his thoughts, as he is deeply concerned as to whether the Altair's party got scammed by someone or something because the condition to start the dragon raid is that the saint, Lucius has to discover the dragon heart in the tomb. And apparently, Lucius has cancelled all plans and shut himself inside the third parish. As he commands his army, a shouts of screams from the house can be heard. Regulus goes inside, and shocks appears on his face. He recognizes Grimes and confuses with the needles that stuck onto his body, and suspect that Zephyr uses poison needles. Right in an instant he draws his sword, using all of his auras shouting to Zephyr to step away from Grimes right away. But then, a kick land on the back of his head, blasting him down into the ground. It was Ophelia saying how dare Regulus unsheathe his sword in front of her highness. Confuses him more with why Ophelia, the princess's guardian knight stopping him. Then Altair reveals herself, saying that she has heard the gist of it using mana detection, Regulus's conversation with Philips. As she take off her hood, she said that his question are valid. 
However, he has no right to reject participating in the raid or to harm one of their party member, explaining that the letter his father received was not a letter of request for reinforcements, but a decree from her, the princess of Kayen, Alter Justina Kayen. And in an instant, Regulus along his army kneel down to greet the princess, Altair. A while later, Zephyr manages to cure Grimes, as he tanks Zephyr with it, asking how can he possibly return that favor. Regulus then apologizes to Zephyr, as he didn't know that he tries to save Grimes earlier. That makes Zephyr relieves, as Regulus doesn't blame other when apologizing, showing promise and Zephyr doesn't need to have to trample him to discipline him. Alter then calls Regulus out, reminding him about the time when they are together in the academy. During group assignments, Regulus's group members were scared of him because he was known for being harsh. But in fact, he always paid attention to points others didn't care about. Thanks to that, the groups that he was in never had any accidents, and he was hard to beat, even for the group she was in, the group consisting of people considered to be geniuses. Even in this case, as both the young lord and the knight order captain, he is taking responsibility to figure out exactly what was going on, and that part of him is what she find very reliable. Altair then introduces Zephyr as the Exalted One, sent by the goddess Arya through a revelation to save the saint who was in danger, as well as this entire world. That surprises both Regulus and Zephyr at the same time, as Altair reveals the letter that Lucius sent, that himself wrote, adding that they must consider Zephyr's will to be the goddess's will, and obey. Regulus cries with happiness, praying to the goddess Arya then proclaims that he will serve Zephyr to the best of his ability, while Altair winks at Zephyr, and he can only face bombs himself, thinking what a masterpiece that is, as he remembers that she is a master of bullshit, and she even forged that letter. Right after, both of them walks out from the room, while Zephyr thoughts how her ability to bullshit is out of this world. Then Zephyr also stroke her head out of habit. Meanwhile, another party member still looks at him with a disdain eye. Still, the party members that they met at the station accepted Zephyr as the operation commander without much issue. Of course, that also means he has taken responsibility for all kinds of duties, as they depart to the nest, the great elfin forest. Right after they entered, Ned expresses how he expected the forest to be completely destroyed like the farmland. But it turns out that the forest still remain. Alter then explain that it's different from the outside, since the mana density is high. She then adds that once they cross the forest's remote village, they can't travel on horseback, since the horses get scared by the thick mana in the air. As they go deeper into the forest, Zephyr suddenly feels something. Even it was just for a moment and very subtle, he felt a gaze from within the forest. Alter notices him acting weird so she asks what's wrong, so Zephyr has something that he would like to confirm. Altair says that the last message from the remote village is two days ago. A homing pigeon flew their way when they were at the relief station. The mages dispatched from the magic tower confirms that they set up magic such that red smoke would rise from the village if any problems arose. Then Ophelia also says that she has confirmed with her eye ability, but she doesn't see any signs of ambush nor stealth skill in the area. What Zephyr knows about the great elfin forest was from his dear friend, as he reveals that his hometown is not an entertaining story and it's nothing more than an old, meaningless story then. But then, he decides to tell the story anyway. In fact, he told Zephyr stories of this forest around the bonfire, as if to chase away the darkness. Thanks to that, Zephyr knows very well, though this place is surprisingly beautiful. It is a forest of evil that devours humans enraptured by its beauty. So Zephyr whispered to Ned, telling him to protect the merchantry leader, as Zephyr informs him that an ambush might come at any time. Right after that moment, the forest moves as it has its own mind forming a door. Altair notices that it's the door of the forest, a device made to restrict entry to outsiders. She knows that was supposedly much deeper in the forest, past the remote village, yet they haven't reached the village. Then the door forms a face, calling out to the humans in front of it, telling them to go back, and says that this is not their land. Zephyr takes out a sword from his silver room, saying that two days is more than enough time for enemies to occupy the base, readily to go through the door with violence. Then Zephyr asks what happened to the people from the remote village. Altair steps in, telling him to stop then introduces herself as the human's princess and offer to the elf behind the door to converse. The elf is mad, saying that they have told her of their will several time using homing pigeons. Any resolutions through conversation have been severed due to her brother, with how he strong-armed the elder of the elf, making an agreement that favor the humans for the border of the forest and the river between the elf and the humans. Along with it, he get a valuable items from the elf, leaving the elf no choice but to follow what he wants. And now, the forest starts attacking the party, with the root that move, messing up the soldier footing. 
Elves are beings that have long ears, lifespans several times longer than humans, and high affinity with mana. They are a race that built their own kingdom in the Great Elfin Forest and survived for a very long time. For over 2,000 years, they advanced their own distinctive magic and restructured plants to create a comfortable nest, as well as an impenetrable fortress using the forest's overflowing life force. The forest keeps attacking the soldier, and as a horse step into a red beads that rest on the forest's floor it explodes. Meanwhile, Altair is calm, expresses how unfortunate it is that the elf decide to go this way. From behind the door, a magic shoots up to her. A green-yellowish beam of light come through towards her. A yellow-haired elf overseeing the watchtower interior. As they watch the magic beam shoots up towards the group of humans. One of the man addresses her as princess, claims how the humans are no match for them. Then she yells at him to not take his hand off the crystal. From the blast appear a silhouette of the humans. It was Zephyr shielding Altair from the light beam using the Dragon Slayer's cape, which reduces damage from magic of all attribute. Along with it, the healer captain uses a barrier of light, which blocks enemy attacks using sacred power. Zephyr poetically asks whether Altair is alright, as she thanks him for covering her. Zephyr knows that the gatekeeper elves that control the door of the forest are nothing but average foot soldiers. No matter how well made the device is, it's not enough to stop him. Right at that moment, Zephyr uses the dragon tongue magic, saying open the door, calling them imbeciles, and so the door opens up. Now Zephyr has an eye to the watchtower, noticing the identity of the gaze that he has been feeling since earlier. In an instant, he dashes into the massive tree that overseeing the forest, punching away the soldier elves then has his hand on the elf's princess. He then says that even though she looks like a kid, she might already be a hundred of years old, so he will just slap her once and conversing will come after. As he going to smack her, he notices that she looks different from the one that he knows, and she also has two different colored eyes. Suddenly, there's an arrow that comes right down towards him, destroying the tree into pieces and blasting Zephyr away losing his grip from the princess. The princess calling out to the elf that strike the arrow, calling him as idiot for trying to kill her. Then she will send him the coordinates again, asking him to kill Zephyr for sure this time. Meanwhile, Zephyr recognizes the skill along with its power, he knows that it's definitely him. One of the strongest ten of the continent, the strongest archer that joined the human resistance force later on and made the demons tremble in fear, the divine archer, Dariel. Right a moment later, he got the coordinates from his sister, claiming that he will finish Zephyr off with his next attack. That instant, he shoots his arrow, shooting from a kilometer away, making the party on the site confused looking where the next attack might come from. The mage then uses a Grease Eye, a long-range golems that share video and sound information. As she commands her golems to fly up in the sky, a shock of horror runs down on her face, witnessing such a powerful shot of an arrow from such an absurd distance. But Zephyr, the target of the attack is ready. Without even flinching he prepares his stance to receive the attack. In a split second their attack meet and Zephyr manages to deflect the attack. Still, the backlash are pretty heavy on him, with blood pouring down from both of his hand, receiving pretty heavy injury. That in fact, surprises the princess for able to deflect the arrow then assumes that it must have been a coincidence, only to notice that Zephyr's arm is already injured. So she tells her brother to shoot his strongest skill, Crimson Meteor. Dariel releases three consecutive arrow manifesting into a meteor. That instead makes Zephyr even more fire up, realizing that it's Crimson Meteor, that three times faster and stronger than regular arrows. He also knows that the arrows are too fast to stop using Dragon Tongue, and the shock wave will wipe out the other party members. So he instantly summons his Dragon Heart's power. With his Crimson Red Eyes, his movement seems very slow. The traces of his sword seemed slow, yet fluid, but in actuality, not even a second passed. In the next moment, the traces became a dragon and surged upward. The Dragon King style, as its name suggests, symbolizes a dragon. However, that's only because the flow of mana and martial arts resembles a dragon, and as far as Ned knows, has nothing to do with a real dragon. Looking at Zephyr mustering those power like that, makes him knows that there are a stage like that. Kiara is shocked learning that a human manages to do that. That makes her wonders whether Zephyr is a dragon taking a human form. Remembering her sick mother, she finally giving in, surrenders to the party of humans that comes into her territory. Right after, she says that whether Zephyr is dragon or a human, she begs them to help the elves, and Zephyr nonchalantly agrees to her request. It is explained that the Lake of Life, which spreads throughout the great elfin forest through river streams to keep the massive forest alive, 
the powerful vitality and healing ability of that lake became the foundation of the elves' prosperity, and once the water flowed out from the forest through a narrow stream into the Danakil estate, that land became the greatest granary in human territory, and the massive tree that grew while drinking the water from the Lake of Life is the Tree of Life. The tree itself holds sacred power and is the being that gives high elves their power. The elven kingdom was prosperous for 2,000 years due to that. But after the blue dragon made the lake of life into its nest, the water of life filling the lake soon became poisonous and spread throughout the forest. A year after the blue dragon appears, two high elves known as Scarlet Moon and Black Moon invaded Danakil. They were overpowered by the elves and almost lost their land. But at that time, Prince Polaris participated in the battle as a cardinal while leading his temple knights. And the elves fled to the heart of the forest because of the gold dragon that soon joined the battle. Ultimately, that war ended in the human victory in the form of a ceasefire treaty. And one year later, the farmland was polluted by poison. Now, Altair's objective is to form an alliance with the elves to do the dragon raid. Start with Zephyr helping the elves to threats elves that affected by the blue dragon's poison. Still Dariel is cautious of Zephyr to an extent. A while later, Altair continues her bullshit with praying to Goddess Aria, saying that the Goddess of Light is guiding them through the Exalted One, that makes the soldiers worship Zephyr as he is feeling annoyed by it. On the morning next day, the party moves closer towards the Tree of Life to scout where the Blue Dragon resides. Kiara shows them the plant that originally created to support the elves, but now turned into a flower that spray poison mist, and some that has become a monster factory. Also, Dariel agrees to form an alliance only if their priority is to protect their village from the monsters surging from the forest. Zephyr says that's obvious, they will eradicate the monster all while gathering some magic stones and production material in the process. The fight with the monster on the outer area then starting, the mages using their magic, with the support of the priestess and the healer, as well as Ophelia and Ned with each showing off their skill and strength, and with that they manage to protect the village on the outskirt of the affected area. Later that day, Dariel thanks Zephyr for helping them with it. Yet, he reveals that the two items that Zephyr has requested are key items that protect that village from contamination, and he can't give them out away like that. Zephyr has enough of it, telling Dariel to stop bullshitting anymore, and just tell him what Daryl needs, loud and clear. All this time, even though Dariel still feels suspicious of Zephyr, he tries to be courteous to him. Then, Zephyr lays it out, he needs to create a perfect cure that will save the Elf Queen restore the lake and tree of life, then slay the blue dragon. Zephyr explains that for the first one, the sap from the tree of life is the main ingredient, and for the second, the tree will be restored on its own as long as the blue dragon leaves or dies. Zephyr gives him the middle finger, saying that they just need to kill the dragon. Zephyr makes it clear that he will slay the dragon, so he pushes Dariel with what he needs more than that. Still, Dariel is not sure about it. He isn't confident that Zephyr is able to slay the dragon. And if the dragon rampaging after a failed attempt, there will be harder next time they need to raid it. That pisses Zephyr off, telling him to not misunderstand it, because there is no next time. They faces off with their rage on, as Zephyr explains that that matter is something that must be done as soon as possible, by squeezing out every last drop of strength they can muster, and it's not something they can wait and see on. In the end, even though Dariel fails to getting through Zephyr, he agrees to let their strength do the talking. That instant, Zephyr summons his dragon power as Dariel shoots his arrow right towards Zephyr from that point-blank range. That's when Dariel lays out his frustration, as he assumes that Zephyr now should understand, since he must be wanting Dariel to be the main damage dealer. His arrow doesn't even able to scratch a dragon scale, that is the extent of his skills. He feels hopeless in the face of the blue dragon, even though he wants to kill that dragon as soon as possible. It's impossible for him to do with his current strength. Zephyr tells him to stand up, explaining that he is weak because of his items are trash as he break Dariel's bow in half. That surprises him, along with Altair who knows the quality of the bow, as Zephyr tells him to stop crying, while adding that he will make him a new bow. A while later, Kiara is crying over the broken bow, saying that even though Zephyr will make a new bow for his brother, he should have let another person use it. Philip also appraised the bow, noticing how expensive that bow is that is about a heroic grade weapon. On the other hand, Dariel is surprisingly relief with the fact that Zephyr would make him a new bow, saying that Zephyr didn't break his bow, but his indecision. Since he has nothing to rely on now, he can put his life on the line to raid the blue dragon, while Ned thoughts that it turns out Dariel is just as insane as Zephyr. Later that day, they gather on the inner part of the castle, as both Kiara and Dariel give their blessing to Zephyr to use both their last means of defense, the water of life, and the branch of the tree of life. 
Right after, Zephyr drinks up the whole glass of the last pure water of life that the elf have. With his perks that he has, Zephyr's body immediately filled with an overflowing vitality. Zephyr then sits down right away, performing his dragonification along with a skill called Microcosmic Orbit, a skill that allow him to control flow of mana to heal internal injuries and increase his mana capacity through repetition. Along with it, Altair assists him in the process to increase his power output from his dragon heart. Since they don't have time, they need to force the process and direct that overflowing vitality and the dragon's power all into the dragon heart. That process doesn't come easy, as pain run through every fiber of Zephyr's body and makes him throws up blood. Right after, the priestess helps to heal him right away, praying to the goddess area. Both Zephyr and Altair push themselves together, aiming to make Zephyr able to output 10% of the dragon's heart. Knowing they have a hard time, Ned sits behind him, assisting Zephyr with the flow of his mana, as he's saying that Zephyr's breathing is all over the place. He is happily assists his now acknowledged disciple, while he is thinking that the one who can best support a Dragon King style master's cultivation is a fellow Dragon King style master. Using his hand to help, he will guide Zephyr, hoping him to tame that rampant power. With that Zephyr is able to progress further in taming the dragon heart and in increasing his physical strength to be able to muster more of it. A moment later, a light fills the room. Dariel is one of the first person to witness Zephyr's new form. A crimson red eyes, body full of dragon scale and a pair of dragon wings bloomed from his back. Ned smiles, while the healer falls down with sweats drenching on their face. Altair holds onto her staff, smiling towards Zephyr, expressing how amazing he looks right now as he is manages to muster 10.1% the power of the dragon heart and achieve the second form of dragonification. Right after, Zephyr asks Dariel to bring a towel to him, then uses it to shut his own mouth. What he does next shocks the soft and adorable prince as Zephyr rips his own scale, explaining that a dragon's scale can't be penetrated by regular metal, but a power of another dragon will. Even though it's only a small amount of its true power, those are scales from the strongest dragon, Kaiserus, and Zephyr is excited to rip all of it and make his first dragon weapon in this life. On the next day, with a clear gold, a dragon scale, blood rubies, and arrow shafts, Zephyr makes a new weapon using his dragon tongue magic, Flow. In an instant, he is able to craft a black dragon bow along with a black dragon arrows that will be wielded by the strongest archer in the continent, Dariel. At this point, it's two weeks until the raid, all the humans and elves were spurred in preparation. Ned will handle the training for that two weeks, and the hunting team will be handled by Ophelia, going to clear the path towards the middle of the forest. Along with it, magic stones from the monsters accumulated like crazy, yet they all are disappeared in an instant to be used to craft weapons, golem cores, fort construction and strengthening and magic circle installation. Meanwhile, Altair is cooking a strategy that she will use the last branch of life as the core to be the safe zone so the poison mist won't be able to enter the area. As for Zephyr, he keeps cultivating trying to keep increasing his dragon here output. As long as he can maintain his dragon form for 30 minutes he will have a chance against the blue dragon with the support of the party. Also, he repeatedly uses the dragonification and keeps making the black dragon arrow, helping with creating the path to squeeze everything out to the utmost limit and surpass it. At the night before the raid, the soldiers have a long night to rest, and after dinner Zephyr immediately left claiming that he will take a long sleep to rest. Looking at him, Altair then follows him, saying that her skin is a mess after all that work, adding that she should sleep early as well. Ophelia tries to offer herself to accompany her, but Ned holds her off reminds her that she would be his sparring partner tonight. Before all of that, Altair tries to form a raid party no one from the qualified nobles to strong adventurers are willing to help her. She can only trust a small amount of people that were she built up with trust since before. But then, as if it were all a lie, everything started to go smoothly because of Zephyr. An unexpected stroke of luck and fate, that's what others would call it. But she doesn't believe in those kind of things, as she goes into Zephyr's tent. Without saying anything, she reaches out her hand to him, inviting him and then giving him a kiss. A time stop as it's the first time Zephyr is able to kiss her like that since her death in his previous life. But chill runs down his spine, shocking him as it turns out that Altair uses a skill called a kiss of darkness, which makes him confess anything to her. Zephyr falls down as he asks with what Altair is trying to do, but Altair shut him up, saying that he is not allowed to ask any question. It is fascinating that they managed to work together with the elves, and the blue dragon raid that she thoughts would never begin is happening tomorrow. All thanks to Zephyr in the short span of a month. She has her doubts, so she stayed by his side and kept watch on him 
But after watching him shredded his own scale every single day, she could no longer suppress her doubts and assumes that Zephyr has some sort of goal. If Zephyr develops some sort of malicious intent or are following the orders of another dangerous individual, no one will be able to stop him. Everything will come to an end, just like that. Therefore, she needs to know what his goals is, then she asks who sent him. With the kiss of darkness on his tongue, Zephyr confessed that he is there on his own accord, adding that all of that is for Altair, shocking her. She knows that the skill is in effect, and he is not lying so she tries to ask what does that supposed to mean. Zephyr confessed further that she died for him once, and to change that future he returned to the past. That shocks her further, and as of now, she is able to conjure a dark hand choking Zephyr. She is trembling, shouting to not screw with her. But Zephyr knows, as he says that she must be pretty shocked, and she should know that better than anyone, because Zephyr is under the effect of Kiss of Darkness. He cannot lie about anything she asked him. Right after, he broke through the dark hand, reaching out his hand to hers, as he closing on and tells her to interrogate him as much as she wants, the truth that she is so desires. He wraps his hand around her, as the duration of the skill is running out and kiss her again, after telling her to recast the kiss of darkness again. Meanwhile, somewhere else that night, the elder of the elves is sneaking around meddling with the magic written on the golem that supposedly will be used in the raid and he laughs as he is thinking that those golems will become loyal subordinates who will only listen to his orders. In the morning on the next day, the war drum along with the war trumpet is sounded. Ophelia with the foot soldier, the mages, and Ned which will be stationed a special post. Everyone can feel it. That day, some will return to the dirt, and others will witness a turning point in history. The first order of the plan is to put every strengthening spells on Zephyr, the healer with the magic of the goddess of light, Kiara empowered by the tree of life an altar where she already knew that the path she chose to walk was wretched one filed with blood. But, it was much more wretched than she expected. Where last night, Zephyr assures her that she is already walking down that path, even without any knowledge of the future. Zephyr tells her that since it's his second time, he can do better and at the end of that path, he is going to grab hold of what he really want. And when that time comes, he asks her to be her king, addressing her as the queen. With that belief, Altair uses the strengthening magic from the line of Media. That instant, along with all the buffs, Zephyr immediately manifests his second form, marking the commence of the Blue Dragon Raid. Zephyr is the sole vanguard flies up high in the sky, even though that is a ridiculous idea, but that has the best chance for raid success. With an overwhelming strength and a lightning speed from the Dragon King style, Zephyr open up the path for the Foot Soldier, Long Range Army, and the supports. In an instant, Zephyr slays the huge plants that stands before him, at the same time he realizes that is definitely near the lake, as it's full of huge plants. Using the silver room, he drops off tombstone-type golems that would disperse any mana wavelengths in a 70-meter radius. They would resonate with each other and create a mana road. From then on, the magic that's used from the camp will be passed along all the way until the end of the mana road. Along with it, the mage create a huge video relay golem, called Cyclops, that will become the party's eyes. And with it, Dariel, the long-range damage dealer is able to see the fight from that far distance. At the bottom of the Tree of Life lies down a blue dragon, radiating poison mist several thousands meter away from it. Zephyr manages to sneak right above the blue dragon. As is expected, he managed to come that close without the blue dragon caring about his existence. With it, he can only move within the poison fog for a maximum of 28 minutes, since he used two minutes to move and set up the golems. Right after, he summons a black dragon chain. That was made using Zephyr's scales. First he tied up one end of it into the Tree of Life's branch then dashes down towards the massive dragon. Though, Zephyr knows that the blue dragon is not a poison dragon. The world is simply forgotten the type of being it is, because elves live an average life of 300 years, when high elves about 500 years. And the last time a blue dragon appeared was 600 years ago. The lake of life possesses a strong effect compared to even the prayers of the priests. The reason it suddenly appeared in that place in tatters is to heal itself because the blue dragon has been poisoned by the demon's poison. As Zephyr flies down toward it, the dragon notices him, and in an instant it moves striking his head eating Zephyr whole. But, he manages to hold the teeth that's going to devour him. Because of the dragon weakened state he manages to overpower it with his 19% dragon heart output. Using his dragon king style and his dragon claw, Zephyr decides that the blue dragon will be his first prey then rampaging in its mouth. And with it Zephyr also chains the dragon's mouth with his black dragon chain. 
Right after, he smiles as the time for fishing is come. Using his dragon tongue magic, the strikes come, lifting the massive dragon up from the lake toward the branch. Still, even while injured, the blue dragon able to swing Zephyr around. After using all of his 19% output of the dragon heart, he's still completely losing in terms of strength. So Zephyr summons his dragon slayer sword, swiftly swinging it to slash the inner part of the dragon's mouth. The inside of its mouth is way softer than its scales on the outside. That's also where the important blood vessels and nerves pass through. Zephyr decides to stay close to its insides as possible and deal damage. Right at that moment, the dragon gives up trying to free itself then strike its jaw toward the tiny human right in front of it. That manages to pin Zephyr down, and with it the massive dragon tries to perform its dragon breath from up close, point-blank range. Kiara who's watching from afar knows what that means, along with Dariel knows that blue flame, the one that burned their forest back in time when the dragon came. Though, Altair doesn't lost her composure, commending the support team to prepare their skill, because she knows that it's alright and Zephyr is safe. It turns out that Altair wasn't the only one that notices, the dragon also did. While it wasn't fully in the right state of mind because of the pain of the poison, it knew that it didn't feel anything between its teeth. Since the side of its mouth had felt a sting right before it unleashed its breath, its prey, which it was holding tightly, had disappeared. It turns out that Zephyr used the silver key to enter the silver room to dodge the flame. Right after the dragon unleashed its breath, Zephyr immediately appears again right in front of it. He knows that the chance to counter-attack come right after, and in that instant he performs his thunderclap palm strike. The dragon doesn't have a long downtime, that it performs its own counter as well, going for another breath. Fortunately it has a long time to prepare so Zephyr notices it, using his own dragon breath to explode its dragon breath pocket. Even if it possess great regenerative powers, it won't be able to use its breath for the next 10 minutes, so Zephyr tells the support team to do their strikes. That instant, the priestess uses a thorn of sins, mages that uses an ice spell that bind and froze the dragon right on the trunk of the tree of life. Right after, Dariel who uses the black dragon arrow and the black dragon bow, coats the tip of his arrow with extreme venom. With all of his power he releases it. Along its path, the power of the strikes also clearing the plants that summoned by the massive poison plants, going straight to the tide dragon. The people cheer up as the arrow able to pierce the scale of the blue dragon, along with Kiara who seems really happy that it did. But Dariel still doesn't feel satisfied, as he remembers that time when Zephyr scolds him. Zephyr explains the second reason he is weak is because he lacks real fighting experience, adding that all of him have yet to fight an opponent that would awaken his true strength. Though, even he still doesn't fully understand it yet, he will find out soon, not only his power but his life's mission. Another strikes on the dragon, Crimson Meteor that uses the black dragon arrows, as he understand that the blue dragon is not his end goal, but a stepping stone that he must surpass. Together with the other supporting magics, the blast towards the dragon dealing massive damage. On the other hand, Zephyr is having a hard time looking for the dragon fatal weakness, something specific that located on the dragon's body. As Zephyr is trying to rip his way through its inside, his hands stop moving, it's as if something is gripping it tightly. He notices that something is wrong, which Altair also notices. She immediately commands the party to stop the attacks and turns on defensive, because the Mana Road is changing directions. What Zephyr explained to her is that the Mana Road able to direct their attacks toward the dragon, but the dragon also able to strike its attack towards the party. Then so, the healer cast her defensive spell along with the soldiers put up defensive barrier. As the mage countdown the timing of the mana road changes, she got strike along with the party by a blast from the tombstone golem that comes from the blue dragon. Yet, Zephyr knows, when the water surface starts to suddenly splash around for no reason, and when he get thrown back suddenly, as his black dragon chain breaks, that would mean that from that point on, the dragon will be using the power of its unique attribute, telekinesis, a power that allows it to move objects without touching it. The dragon set its eyes on Zephyr, and when a dragon that has close to infinite mana possesses such a power, that would mean destruction, screams and despair. Yet, Zephyr doesn't lost his composure. With 20 minutes of his dragonification, he stares back at the blue dragon, because he knows, even if the blue dragon is in a daze because of the pain, after it suddenly experiences a great amount of another stingy pain, it will actually sober up and that will be when the true battle starts. The blue dragon sees Zephyr, noticing the sword that he wields, the dragon slayer sword that someone it faced before wielded. At the party's side, they gather their wounded and heal them, while Altair evaluates that their skill's effect will be reduced even further from now on. 
while Dariel has a problem that if he shots his arrow from 1.5 km away, it would take 4 seconds to reach the dragon, even if he uses his fastest skill, Crimson Meteor. So Zephyr needs to stop the dragon from moving at least 4.5 seconds for his arrow to hit, and the dragon raid gate that was opened started to seem like it was closing, and everyone is waiting for that one person the sole vanguard, Zephyr to open it again, as he evades the dragon's strike with his swift movements with the Dragon King style. The strike that's so strong, even the sturdy branch that could take the weight of the dragon was turned to dust, and there's no chance Zephyr could tank that attack head-on. While Zephyr zipping around with lightning speed, the dragon uses its telekinesis to move the branch, finally landing a hit on Zephyr, stopping his movements. That blasts him towards the lake, and as he manages to gain his footing on the air, the blue dragon is ready to strike him with his wide open jaw. Fortunately using electric acceleration, Zephyr manages to dodge the strike, summons his sword again and slit the dragon's mouth. But then, the dragon goes for a swim in the lake trying to recover its injuries. Still, it won't be able to recover that quickly because of poison in the lake, and the bigger problem is the raging wave of the poison lake. The plants that produce byproducts would use the water of life as materials, and the quality of the byproducts would be decided by the amount of water of life that's provided to them. The plants would produce after absorbing all the raging waves of the poison lake would be strong monsters that will march toward the party. With all what they got, they support the golems to deal with the monsters. But, there are too many monsters are appearing, and they decides to push all of them towards the lake so that they don't get in Zephyr's way, and to kill the monsters that are approaching the camp. But then, suddenly half of the golems are changing direction, running away from the battlefield. The golems that had been meddled by the Elder Elf. On top of that, a sudden range attack comes their way, that fortunately Dariel notices, then he shots his arrow towards it. He manages to deflect the attack. But the problem is, the distance between them and the monster's attack who launched that attack is about 700 meters. The party need to stay on their toes, because that monster is definitely on the level of a dungeon boss. In the previous life, the raid took place one year and four months later, where they lost the Black Dragon Heart. But Altair didn't give up. She gathered strong comrades and challenged the Blue Dragon. So, while they did kill the Blue Dragon, they couldn't obtain its Dragon Heart because of a grave mistake they made. The pollution of the Danakil granary was so serious that it was beyond cure. A failure, that's the only word that could be said of the result. Despite all that, after Zephyr came out of the cave, returned to the temple, and started to struggle as he climbed his way up the ranks. One of Ned's enemies, Aldian, was in the third parish. He had to become a temple knight to get closer to him so that he could have a chance at revenge. He overheard Aldian talk with Matthias talk about the princess's failure. It turns out that the failure is the result of the demon god cult schemes, and at that time, Lucius is under the brainwashed control by Aldian. Along with it, the demon god cult possessed two of the dragon heart that had been discovered at that time. But now, inside the silver key, Zephyr knows that this time, the situation is different. He got the black dragon heart, and will get his second with the blue dragon. Also with it, he drinks bunch of potions to recover and uses the video relay golem to see the situation outside. Outside, the monsters uproot a huge trees, then bunch of smaller monsters mount up to it, as the massive one throws them up towards the party. Using the Hippogriff's feather arrows and with the support of his sister, Dariel shots them down. Their combined magic, called Blue Storm and Flame Dance incinerating the monsters that come their way. The rest of the party are also pulling their own weight, but the problem is that there are too many monsters. On top of that, the boss rank monster suddenly cast a magic that makes the swarming monsters disappear all at once, only to appear again right on top of the camp where the party station at, slamming them with their sheer number. Along with it, the boss rank monster also joined the fray, stomping its massive leg onto the masses of the party. Fortunately, Ophelia is there, able to stop it with her sheer physical strength, saving the knights that going to get flattened. She then barrages the massive monster that stand before her with her sword moves, saying that its head is way too high for a monster, commanding it to stand down. Meanwhile, Regulus and a few support members stand guard of the branch to protect it from getting destroyed by the monsters. As Alter sets it up, she tells him that his role is to protect it. The safe region will be destroyed if that branch is gone. So he come into a crossroad whether to help the party outside or stand on guard inside the zone. But then, suddenly Altair shouts while knocking at the door, calling out to him to open the door. Though, he knows that it's probably a monster that uses the princess's voice, 
Still in the end he opens up the door. Waiting outside is the elder elf, using an impe corn to imitating the princess's voice. He then suddenly uses a flashlight spell, blinding the party that guard the branch. In that split seconds, he comes inside then grabs the branch. The sound of the horn whistle then sounded, marking that the core of the magic circle has been stolen, and the elder elf with a few of high elves run way out of the camp. Using the video relay golem, Altair is smiling, asking Zephyr whether he can hear that, and they are about to be in deep shit and telling him to kill the blue dragon within 10 minutes. Zephyr then teases her, asking for a reward, so she offers him to continue what they couldn't finish yesterday. That simultaneously excites and surprises Zephyr with a full heart on Altair wish all of them luck before ending personal communication. Right after, the blue dragon rises up from the lake, set its eyes on Zephyr. The blue dragon was able to recover its breath pocket because it went underwater. If it could endure the damage it was taking, it could use its breath. And, just at that time, its enemy stopped moving because he was distracted. Then it shoots its dragon breath towards the tiny human that still thinks about his reward. Suddenly, Zephyr turns around telling it to shut up, as he summons the stake of faith that he store inside the silver room landing it right on top of the blue dragon's head. He then calling out to the rear squad, commanding them to change the strategy, to follow exactly what he is about to order them to do. Then in 10 minutes that dragon is already dead meat. The group of elves that went AWOL is after the last sealed box, that contain the seed of the Tree of Life, so they can move somewhere else to create another settlement. Meanwhile, one of the strongest ten, a reliable healer that support the masses to stand their ground, and Zephyr who possesses a dragon heart, even the princess who possesses powerful authority is fighting to their teeth. While Dariel is powerful, he is not the center of the elf kingdom, since the queen is sick, known as the Broken Moon and the king that cannot move a muscle in form of the tree. The elder is the one that able to call the shot, and that's how the elves divided in two forces, one that follow Dariel in the raid and one that follow the elder towards the tower that store that last box. But right at the bottom of that tower, there's an entity that scratched the wall of the tower endlessly. It was a demon, a mindless demon that cries, seemingly wants something from the tower. The elder then uses the flying golems to attract that monster's attention. That was a standard tactic, the monster reacted to one of the golems, and right after the other golem threw the explosion seed to break the tower's seal, and the elves able to recover the sealed box leisurely. What they miscalculated was that the box in their hand was an item that the demonic monster wanted for three whole years. Crimson Moon, Masha, a queen candidate 60 years ago, and the elf that caused the war with Danakil four years ago. Because she went through demonification and lost her rationality, all she remembers now is her hostility towards elves. After heavily wounded by the war they wage against the human, she seeks help to the demon god cult's leader along with Black Moon, Ramiel. They then become a pair of demonification monsters, witnessed by the demon god cult executive Twelve Apostles. Three months after they become a demon, they killed everything they came into contact with, both monsters and humans, and they got used to their new powers. After that, Aldean schemes against them, offering to kill the blue dragon, and he will lend his soldiers. At Gala Mountain, the original den of the blue dragon, Artalis. The pair go against the blue dragon as it expresses how that is so ridiculous, and it is rendered speechless seeing the demonification elves. The Eastern One and Aldean the ones who schemes against the elves, thoughts that even the cult has lent them combatants. They are sloppy, and they will just become that dragon food. And that's how they meet their pathetic end, the Dark Moon got swallowed whole by the Blue Dragon. But that's Aldean's goal to begin with, because the Dark Moon demonification form master the art of poisons. He has the demonic skill that evolved over thousands of battles, an extreme venom and petrification. Aldean uses him to make use of those skill to release poison into the dragon's stomach until it dies. In the end it's just going to be a race against time. Will the dragon die first because of the poison or will Black Moon be melted by the dragon's digestive system first? Of course, before everything ends, Black Moon's objective will be accomplished, because the blue dragon will definitely go to the Lake of Life in order to cure its poisoned body. At that point, the blue dragon doesn't care about Crimson Moon because of the pain it experiences, and Masha is hanging on its tail going to the forest of the elf. Also, because she couldn't think properly due to a side effect of the demonification, she hang on not because she had a plan but purely because her instincts. As the dragon flies by the tower that store the sealed box, she is attracted to the energy that stimulated her faint memories, and jumps off toward that tower. She ends up killing the security troopers that are making a lot of noise in the vicinity. But because of the confusion caused by the dragon's appearance and the pollution of that vicinity, no one found out about that tragedy. 
After that day, she spent all of her time clawing away meaninglessly at the tower and feasted as she hasn't done so in a while. The flesh and blood of the elder that had a lot of water of life helped Masha recover the meaning of the various words that were in her ruined mind. The moment she regain her mind again, she sets her eyes towards the aura of this particular being in the tower. It is the Broken Moon, the elf's queen who has been bedridden almost all her life. The Branded Worm allows demon god worshippers to borrow the power of a demon, and the user would grow so that they could use that power. Once their growth stops and evolves, they would gain special abilities. The special ability of the Branded Worm that Masha raised was Gluttony. It's a power that steals the skill of the living organism that she devours. An Elf Elder's skill, Acceleration, a skill that allows elders to stab the weaknesses of their opponents, gave Masha incredible speed that allowed her to reach her destination. She then walks inside the queen's chamber, setting her eyes toward the queen lifeless body, readily devours her whole. With the rage that she has, she dashes towards the queen, but suddenly Ned appears right between them then slashes Masha, preventing her to hurt the queen. All of that time, Ned was left wondering why Zephyr, his disciple sent him to the most rear position while asking him to protect the queen. It turns out that a demon would appear out of nowhere, and in any case, he proclaims that will be her grave, unleashing all of his dragon-style technique to deal with it. Meanwhile, with a full-rise morning wood, Zephyr keeps trading blows with the poisoned blue dragon. The time left before the purification magic circle of the camp is dispelled is 8 minutes and 20 seconds. But he knows, the fight wouldn't be over after the blue dragon dies. He knows that the black moon, Ramiel, who's in the dragon's stomach and is the owner of the poison that polluted the forest will wake up after his petrification is dispelled. That is the real reason Altair's raid failed in the previous life. As the party manages to kill the blue dragon, and when the vanguard is about to claim the dragon heart, Ramiel wakes up from its stomach surprising the party while also claiming the dragon heart. The black moon poison becomes several times stronger as he gets in contact with the dragon heart. His poison burst forth like an explosion and covered the forest, melting everything in the vicinity, while Altair gets the party to retreat immediately and manages to avoid total annihilation. They didn't get the dragon heart and the great elfin forest along with the Danakil granary became even more polluted. It became a hell that no one could live in. Knowing all of that, Zephyr tries to make sure that will not happen. The other reason they failed back then was because they lacked information. There are also two vanguards that could fight freely within the poison fog. And he tells Zephyr back then the dragon seems to move awkwardly, as if it is trying to protect a part of its body. Even with that, Zephyr still fails to find it, and having enough out of it, he summons a scales that had been smeared with extremely lethal poison. Using dragon tongue, he cast explode on the scales after stabs it on the dragon's body, making it screams hysterically. But then, Artalis uses its own dragon tongue to stop the time, making Zephyr unable to move even the water droplets and the leaves stop at its command. A whole different level of power of commanding as compared to a dragonoid who's fundamentally a human but has a dragon heart. Bartali's able to move then open its mouth wide open going to shallow Zephyr hole. Unfortunately now he cannot use the silver room to dodge it. But during the seconds that the time stops for them, Dariel fired two rounds of arrows, landing right on point, making the dragon lost its grasp on Zephyr. And that's the new plan. Zephyr will create an opening for Zephyr and tells Dariel to fire as he pleases. Still it doesn't enough so he fires more arrow towards the dragon, manages to land another hit with it, and destroy its breath pocket. Right after, Zephyr arrives behind the blue dragon, already swinging his sword with full power going for its neck. With that, both of them manages to completely destroy Artalis's breath pockets, and there are 17 black dragon arrows left. Still, the blue dragon yet to be killed, so it frantically rampaging more towards Zephyr, who flies around like a fly evading its strikes. Seeing an opening, Zephyr lands another blows to the dragon's body, while keeps looking for its weakness. But then, Artalis manages to land its own punch to Zephyr blasting him away towards the Tree of Life's trunk. Right at that time, Artalis uses telekinesis to pull the black dragon arrow that stuck on its flesh, then controlling the branches that falls into the lake to fire them towards Zephyr. Using the black dragon chain, Zephyr manages to parry all of it, only to be surprised that the dragon hand is coming at him with full force, stamping him into the tree trunk. Fortunately, Zephyr able to evade it, going around the dragon's hand then summon the stake of faith again, lands right on its neck. On top of that, Zephyr gather his mana on his hand, along with the dragon power he can muster. He punched the stake of faith going through the dragon's neck. Behind Artalis, another barrages of arrows landed again able to land a massive blow. 
with the stake of faith stuck on its neck, a dismembered arm, Artalis sets its eyes on Zephyr who wield the dragon slayer sword. That makes her remember, her lord, Kaiseris, the black dragon who went insane, and got ganged up by the heroes. It was Georgius, who wield the dragon slayer sword who end Kaiseris's life. And 1000 years ago, Artalis thanks him for freeing her lord from Kaiseris's curse. She forgives Georgius for killing her lord, but she promised to kill him if he ever appeared right in front of her. As Artalis remembers all of that, the dragon stopped moving, stands alone on the lonely lake of life. But Dariel and Kiara knows that the tree of life is trembling. Then suddenly Artalis release all of the dragon power within her. She then finally speaks, calling out to Zephyr, who she knows as Georgius the dragon slayer. She didn't know what she said back then was her oath. She takes out the stake of faith that stuck on her neck, as she claims that she mustn't forgive him. She then takes up her dismembered arm. Using dragon tongue she commands it to become a sword. With the azure blue sword in hand, Artalis says that she can finally perform her duty, killing the man who killed her lord, Kaiseris. Twelve minutes before dragonification is over, one dragon breath left. But that number no longer matter before the blue dragon who wield the dancing blade of death, a weapon that is created from burning away life force using dragon tongue. What's needed to deal with that is total concentration and a decision. All other plans for other situation will be thrown away, focusing only on immense power. Zephyr commenced the Berserk Dragon mode, welcoming the strike from the Blue Dragon. That tiny human manages to deflect that massive overwhelming power. But that doesn't stop there because Artalis keeps coming at him, and within a few breath they traded hundreds of blows. Using otherworldly power, Artalis slash vertically down towards Zephyr that manages to split the Tree of Life in half. Yet, Zephyr able to stop that strike in its path, preventing it to go further. He then flies up in the air, remembering what Ned teached him, that just as everything moves, strength also flows from one place to another, like a single leaf that able to split tree trunk in half, using a small amount of power to overpower greater enemies. Zephyr manages to land several strikes onto the dragon in that amount of time he dashed to it. Looking at the injured blue dragon, Zephyr notices something shining in the dragon's body. Something that's stuck, a weapon that seems to have been stuck for a long time. That's what his comrade told him back then. That the blue dragon has a long time wound that it can't recover, its fatal weakness. So Zephyr immediately flies towards it again, while evading the dragon's sword strike. Right at that moment, Artalis dive down into the lake to try to escape again. But Zephyr doesn't let her be, so he summons the black dragon chain to tie her tail. That instead, drags him into the lake along with the dragon, so he comes closer to it to strike his dragon slayer sword. From the camp, Dariel pray to his parent to guide him on his path while shooting his crimson meteor. Though, the arrows miss the dragon, instead hitting the trunk of the tree of life. Still, he shots the arrows again, deliberately hitting the tree that finally break it. At the same time as Artalis swinging her sword going to strike Zephyr, the trunk lands on top of her. With that opening, Zephyr goes to strike the weapon that stuck on Artali's body, and with a single strike it makes the dragon screams uncontrollably. As it turns out that 1000 years ago, Georgius didn't left Artali's bee. He strikes her with his dragon slayer sword, and they had a short battle. Though, it's more accurate to say that she got beaten up one-sidedly because she let her guard down. Along with it, Georgius stuck the White Queen's finger on her body. A stake made from the first queen's bone, it seals the power of its target and the target cannot remove the curse by oneself due to the effects of the curse. Artalis is now finally able to remember it clearly, what happened a thousand years ago. And in that case, the person right in front of her is not Georgius, so she takes a closer look at him. Zephyr, the new dragon slayer, the person who succeeded Georgius. Right after the blue dragon is killed, Ramiel notices that the blue dragon's life force has stopped reacting. He then wakes up from his deep slumber, the moment for him to get his hands on its dragon heart has come. But then, suddenly a sword strike comes right to him. It was Zephyr, forcefully taking him out from the blue dragon's stomach. Right after, Zephyr strikes him again, blasting him away towards the tree, then taking the dragon's corpse into the silver room. And now another battle commence, between Zephyr against the demonification Dark Moon. Yet, before he is able to make any move, Zephyr uses the black dragon chain to bind him onto the tree. In an instant he appears with the stake of faith on his hands. There, he stakes him, then spins the stake going to rupture's Ramiel body. Unfortunately, he wasn't there, manages to slip away, only to appear on top of the tree branch. Zephyr then uses the dragon tongue magic to bind Ramiel on it, then chases him with the stake going for the same attack. But as Zephyr attacks him, he summons a poison barrier that manages to block the stake. At this point, Zephyr is on his last breath. 
He is about to faint after using that dragon tongue, and his body is a tatters, but he has no other choice. So he summons the Sword of Light, but the Goddess of Light doesn't permit it. In the end, summoning the sword only burns him, so he has no other way but to get away from Ramiel. At that opening, the Dark Moon summons his ultimate skill, a Venom Spear, then strike it. He laughs ecstatically, saying that he loves that moment, a being who's stronger than him, an overwhelming strong being that he would become humble towards unwittingly. As it is not enough, he also summons an orb, gathering poison mist around him, concentrating it into a single orb that able to melt everything. But then, suddenly the root of the tree are moving, striking Ramiel in the chest. Now Zephyr laughs at him, thanks to him that uses that stupid skill. He sucked up all the poison in that area, and thanks to that, the tree of life and the lake are clean. Then for a good measure, Zephyr comes closer at him, using the last bit of Dragon Heart's power, and the Dragon King-style technique, he decimates Ramiel's head. Before Zephyr's news could reach the camp, the rearguard could already feel it. The Tree of Life was resurrected. The soldiers are cheering up, as Altair asks whether Zephyr could hear them. But she fails to get a response, and Zephyr falls down into the lake. Fortunately the Tree of Life welcomes him with his root. As he thanks Zephyr, a young dragonoid, and since Zephyr helped the tree, he decides to help Zephyr as well, taking the human into his trunk. On the other side, Ned also notices that the roots of the Tree of Life have been revived. That means Zephyr had succeed, as he himself already killed the Crimson Moon. But, she is stronger than he anticipated after absorbing the Elder's skill, and he is not in a great shape after losing a lot of blood against her. At that moment, a vine moves as it wants to hug him. It was the queen, who wakes up from her deep slumber telling Ned to not be surprised, and explaining that Vine acts as her hands and feet. She is unable to move, however, he protected her, so she asks to allow her to express her gratitude as she wakes up from her bed. She is Sylvester, the queen of the elves, asking Ned to come over. Meanwhile, a dream about when Zephyr is little evading his sleep, the memories of her mother and all. He wakes up in the chamber inside the Tree of Life. The first question he wonders is how much time has passed since he fallen. A voice can be heard saying that it has been 72 hours, 18 minutes and 29 seconds, while also asking him to not move yet, as he is currently recovering. Yggdrasil shows himself to Zephyr, the being of Tree of Life. Zephyr now knows the Tree of Life, but Dariel never told him anything in his past life. Yggdrasil then explained that the only person who has seen him in that form is his wife, since he cannot show such a large reincarnation as that outside his body. He has never shown his children, Dariel and Kiara that form either. That makes Zephyr wonders whether he can read other people's thoughts. So Yggdrasil then explained that he is only deciphering the signals coming out of Zephyr's body, and that is his power offering to stop if it offends him. He then commands a twig of the tree to give Zephyr a fruit, explaining that if he eat that fruit enriched with his sap, Zephyr will recover quickly. He then explains that even though he can't move as he was infected by poison, he can see through his children and could observe Zephyr, and Zephyr even has kept his wife safe with telling Ned where to go. He adds that he knows that is called a bilateral contract, so Yggdrasil will offers him something in return. Yet, Zephyr has no freaking idea what he is talking about, and what he can remembers of Yggdrasil from Dariel is that his father is a demigod, someone who's akin to a god but hasn't reached that state. Yggdrasil then mentioned the dragon heart inside Zephyr, he knows that it has a side effect, to transplant it into such a fragile body, so Yggdrasil offers to help Zephyr with it. He will also make Zephyr's body stronger to be able to transplant the blue dragon's heart as well. Along with it, he also asks Zephyr for a request as well. After the whole ordeal, telling the stories of the past and future, Yggdrasil reveals that he is one who knows the truth of the world, with the symbol of the Oath Ring, an overwhelmingly stronger one. Even only looking at it, already send a jolt of headache to Zephyr, so Yggdrasil tells him to not look at it for too long. He then explained that along with the seven dragons and him, are beings bound by missions given to them by the Almighty. As long as they have that, they cannot run away from their mission until they die. The only thing he need to do is to help Zephyr with the transplant of the blue dragon's heart, and his request to Zephyr is to kill Yggdrasil when the time comes, so he won't hurt his wife or children because of his mission. Now, the same ordeal goes to Zephyr again. A whole fighting against the blue dragons will inside his consciousness. After summon his past life power, in turns he is surprised to see a woman inside, where he supposedly to see the blue dragon. There when he realizes that the blue dragon is a sheep, on top of that, she take the human form which unheard of from the dragon even in his past life. The different in this life is that Zephyr already got the black dragon's will with him, which is basically he already got Kaiseris permission. And Kaiseris is her lord, so Zephyr will have her power without much of a fight. 
right after that raid finished. He comes out from the trunk of the Tree of Life. What welcomes him are his comrades, along with Altair with them. So Zephyr asks why she is waiting out there, which she said that she is waiting for him. That instant, he jumps off from the root of the Tree of Life to receive Altair in his arm. 